What's up, traders? Anthony Crudelli here, and thank you for tuning in to the Futures Radio Show podcast. Today, my guest was Michelle Schneider. Michelle is a managing director at Market Gauge. She's also the author of the best selling book, Plant Your Money Tree, and former New York floor trader. When Michelle was on the floor, her badge was Mish. So throughout today's interview, of course, I called her Mish. Mish is a lot like you and I. She develops a macro theme before she goes to the charts and looks at the technicals and the markets that she's trading. And right now, Mish's macro theme is trading stagflation. I know many of you listen to other podcasts and you're hearing a lot of traders talking about trading inflation or trading deflation. Well, in today's show, we focus solely on trading stagflation. Inflation. Remember, Futures Radio Show is sponsored by CME Group. And on May 3rd, CME is launching Micro Bitcoin Futures. To learn more about Micro Bitcoin Futures, please go to activetrader.cmegroup.com. You can listen to Futures Radio Show podcast anywhere where podcasts are available. But if you want to watch Futures Radio Show, check us out on YouTube or anthonycrudelli.com. This show is also sponsored by Trading Technologies, TradeStation, and FTSE Russell. The Russell 2000 is a key benchmark for small cap U.S. stocks. Be sure to check out the E-mini Russell 2000 future symbol RTY and micro E-mini Russell 2000 future symbol M2K. To learn more about FTSE Russell and their products, please visit FTSERussell.com. Mish, welcome to the show. Thank you, Anthony. What a pleasure to be here. It's great to speak with you. I've been following you from for years. I called you Mish because that was your badge. You actually have a commodity background. Uh, you were on the floor for a lot of years. Yes, I was in the New York Commodities Exchange. I started out in coffee, sugar, cocoa, went over to Comex, traded gold and silver, went over to the Merck, spent most of my years there trading crude oil, and then ended up my career on the floor in Finex before I finally went and traded upstairs. Oh, well, we're gonna definitely gonna talk about commodities today. That's one of the reasons why I was so excited to speak with you today. We're gonna to talk about crude oil for sure, but I wanna start off, Mish, talking about Ethereum because I've talked about this pretty vocally. This is my strongest uh, look right now. I'm long Ethereum uh, in a full position and actually a good day for you and I to talk about it because we're seeing a decent pullback. And I saw in your Twitter stream that you are also very bullish Ethereum. Uh, talk to us about how that trade has set up for you and what your thoughts are on Ethereum. Well, up until about a month ago, I was all over Bitcoin and we didn't exactly trade Bitcoin through buying Bitcoin itself because of our clientele really wanted to look at more alternative means. So we were buying it through GBTC, which is the grayscale. We were buying it through Riot, Macro Strategy, Canaan. And, uh, and then all of a sudden it just seemed like um, it couldn't get through that 60,000 one more time. And I started looking elsewhere as I was doing more research and found that Ethereum to me was more interesting because of the blockchain technology. So it's more than just a currency. And I, I like that. So the whole network has been really supported by Amazon Web Services. And when I look more and more into it, I started to discover how innovative that whole space could be for banking, lending, global transactions. And I think it's the future. So when I looked at the actual chart, because I still rely on the charts ultimately, I noticed that from January 2021, it was making higher lows on every swoon down. And so we got in just at around 1660 and uh, but we did it through again a trust the ETHE -E. and so we got in uh, right the the price was sort of comparable at that point and then uh, we took a little bit of profit just because we like to lock in but we're we're hanging in there for the long haul I think Ethereum can go to 24 2500 pretty soon actually no I feel the same way uh, going back to what you talked about how you started to get into Ethereum really started the same way for me. You know, I talked to a lot of people on this show and what I've learned from speaking to a lot of people that are in crypto is that Ethereum is actually being used. I still don't know. I mean, I've owned Bitcoin a bunch of times. I'm not in any Bitcoin right now, but 
I, I really look at Bitcoin and say to myself, what am I going to use this for? Yeah, maybe you could barter it and use it in, in, in that way. But Ethereum is now being used and the NFTs, think about how popular that's getting, right? They're, they're, they're building on Ethereum. Then you have the Visa story last week, or maybe it was a week and a half ago, almost two weeks already, was really a trigger for me because when I saw that Visa is now going to allow people to pay off debt and USDC off of Ethereum. I'm like, you know what? I just think it's going to bring in this flow of money where I, I don't think that a lot of people still know how to even buy Ethereum. So that was really kind of how my story came to it. And just like you said, I went to the charts afterwards and I looked at it and said, it's setting up really well on the technicals. Um, how is that how a lot of your trades set up first? Uh, is it it's set up with a story and a theme and then you go to the charts? Absolutely right on, Anthony. That is exactly how I function. Considering I started out on the commodities floor, it wasn't like I had an opportunity to do a lot of research on other commodities. I was all about the commodity I was in, which sort of forced me into a theme. So, yeah. for example, if I was looking at sugar because I was trading sugar, I, I may or may not be so interested in the news, but I knew that it was a theme that obviously sugar was going to go up in more inflationary times. And I caught really that whole swoon because I went down there. I hate to age myself, but it was back when the commodities went crazy in the late 70s, early 80s. And that's when I said, but you know what? This is moving so fast or I'm interested in this idea or wow, it looks like maybe across the way gold is starting to percolate, I better look at a chart. And that's really how I do everything because I have to look at some kind of a historical price action or I feel like I'm just shooting in the dark and that's definitely not my style. Yeah, really the best macro people that I, that I know and talk to, even though a lot of their ideas still come from, you know, a macro thought process, they have this theme, this idea, they go to the charts just because it helps them manage their risk. Right. Just because you have a macro idea, you still have to look at something to be able to execute it. Where are you wrong? I mean, that's something that you and I know from being on the floor is that as traders on the floor, we always know where we're wrong before we're getting in. And that's just something that we were taught and drilled into our minds. And these days being off the floor and there's so many things going on. And this is where I want to go to next with you. There's so many themes happening. And there's so much to talk about. But with you having a commodity background, I want to go to oil because. This is a market that I trade on the swing side of things. I have been waiting for pullbacks in oil. I, I, I told everybody a week ago on my podcast, I bought it. I got very bullish on that pullback. It was finally one. I actually got out of that trade only in Ethereum right now in my swings. And I'm looking at oil and it's starting to get a little fuzzy on the charts. It's not holding what I'd like to. What are you seeing? Do you have a theme for oil? And then talk to us about maybe what some things you're seeing on the charts. Well, so oil itself is so interesting because of the whole alternative energy space that didn't exist when I was trading oil. So it was all about oil. And of course, we're still a very much dependent oil and gas economy, yes. but yet we have this growing presence with alts, solar and wind in particular. And then of course, now we have an administration which is friendlier to the alternative energy, which ironically, of course, has now taken a big tumble over the last couple of weeks. So in terms of the oil itself, it's very politically charged, number one, still has been and always will be, as long as OPEC is involved. So OPEC now, of course, is talking about starting to raise production, assuming that the demand coming back from the economy's reopening will sort of counteract any kind of a glut. Um, and then you have the Iran nuclear deal back on the table with Biden. There were some great sanctions there. We only later to find out recently that Iran was actually going around the sanctions and buying oil from and, and selling oil to other places outside of the United States. So there's so much there. And that's really where being, again, a commodities trader comes so in handy because you have to kind of block out all that noise and look at just the pure price action. So what the price action is right now is it definitely had a breakout over a base that it had after the tremendous drop that we saw last year when, you know, went to zero and all of that. Um, and so I think that I would say I'm still friendly. I'm not wildly bullish. I thought maybe we could get to $75 a barrel 
and hold 60 and we're sort of fluttering right here around the 58 to 60 dollars a barrel i look at uso primarily uh because i've really kind of switched as uh we have more and more clients into the etf space when i can trade commodities as opposed to actual futures so looking at the uso it's holding desperately here at 40 and so I would want to see it now get back through 42 to give me confidence that it was going to start through another leg, which would probably relate to close to $65 a barrel. And if we break down under $58 a barrel, then I think a lot of this, the, just the whole confusion, not only about whether or not we'll actually reopen globally, besides in the United States, but even what's going to happen in the Middle East and with OPEC plus, then we probably might see another dip down and we'll see what happens at around $50 a barrel, which would probably put the USO at around 37, 35 to 37. Pretty much every macro person I follow right now is so bullish oil. I would say that there, there's a couple of things that I see. A lot of people still bullish gold macro people. Uh, we might get into that a little bit. We probably will get into that, but, and, and everybody is so bullish oil that I'm wondering if that's a story now that's already played itself out. And because you have that commodity background and you said you thought it could maybe get up to 75, I mean, what is what do you think the theme is for oil at this point to get that next leg to, to go higher? What would really get you bullish like a lot of these macro people that I am following uh, right now? Is it just price that you're looking at technically to prove it or is there something else uh, a theme well, building. I, well, there's definitely, the Middle East is becoming more and more a factor again. And what's what was so interesting about the last administration is that everybody expected a tremendous amount of volatility globally, geopolitically, and yet there was relative calm, except for the tensions with China and the whole trade situation. There was calm everywhere. And now with the new administration where people are expecting things to improve in terms of our relationships, globally, it seems like things might be heating up a little bit again. So there's that always bubbling out there. And I was on the floor for the Persian Gulf. And what's so interesting about the news versus the price is like in 1986, when oil dropped to historical lows, that was the bottom. By the time the news shows up, it's usually too late. So it's that kind of thing now. It's like you have to have one ear on what's percolating, but on the other side, discount all of that. In terms of the wildly bullish calls, if it holds up here strong and doesn't really sell off very much, yeah, I think you're going to see buying coming in. But so much is going to depend on the reopening of not just the United States, but the global travel. And there's so much fear still with another wave and the variants and the vaccine rollouts good here in the US, but not so good in other countries. So it's on pause. And that's probably a good thing. They say never short of dull market. So right now I would certainly not get bearish in oil, but we're completely aside. We were actually long some of the oil companies, especially the oil companies that had one foot in oil traditional, and then another foot in developing alternative energy to keep up with the changing times like British Petroleum and Valero. We're flat those now. I would be looking also for entries possibly into some of those oil related companies, because like I said, they'll take advantage of both, whatever happens first, the exploration into more solar or whether or not it's, well, we have to continue to use our oil and we have a lot of oil um, and, and OPEC continues to cut back. So I don't have any clean answer for you right here. I, I wish I did, but I don't. Yeah, you know, and knowing the macro story behind oil is definitely not my thing. But when I look at the charts, it looks so similar to so many markets that we've seen where you have this move that goes further than you thought it would go. I mean, let's face it, nobody was calling for $68 oil when it was, what, at the beginning? Yeah, I think even just three months ago, I think that was most people didn't think it was going to get there as quickly as it did. And I look right. at so many chart patterns these days, Mish, where it's like everything just goes. It's all about my momentum. And then when momentum, when momentum finally stalls, you just have like this kind of holding pattern. And it looks almost like what gold looked like uh, besides really like Ethereum and maybe Bitcoin and maybe, you know, stocks <laughs> or NASDAQ or S&P. Most of these what we're seeing, what I see a lot is that pattern of that just straight run up, come down, sitting here, and then you finally get that opportunity to get in, and it just feels like it chops everybody up. 
And because everybody was so bullish crude oil, I'm looking for the same thing. The, the same people that I listen to that were, have been bullish it, uh, now when it comes back down, like you said, it's kind of gotten, like the ideas aren't fresh. We're kind of just stuck here. So it, it's good to hear from you that uh, that's really kind of thinking. And I think for day traders out there, it makes you really recognize that we could just be rangy and choppy for a bit. And there were certainly plenty of times on the floor where crude oil didn't do very much and we would sit around in the pits talking, waiting for something to happen. So it's like the cycle of every single thing, whether it's a commodity, whether it's crypto. I mean, obviously, Bitcoin's kind of going through a lull right now as well, it or it's a stock or it's an ETF or it's a currency. Things will shift, things will rotate. And I love that you use the word momentum because momentum is something you don't hear very often from a lot of traders because it's an invisible indicator. You don't see it. On the floor, you felt it. Yeah. But in the charts, you don't see it unless you specifically understand how momentum works. So yeah, the momentum in a lot of things right now has waned. Even if we look at the general stock market, the Russell 2000, which started out, I call it Grandpa Russell, with Geritol and looked like it was going to continue to race off to the moon as everything rotated more into the industrials and manufacturing is now stalled. And the momentum has actually diverged to negative where the momentum is under the 50-day moving average while the price is sitting right there on the 50-day moving average. And that's where we seem to be at with a lot of, of the different instruments right now. So we're not all that committed as we were, say, in January, starting yeah. in October, November, where we had like 20 positions on in the discretionary account. We're down to 10 or 11. Well, we're going to pause for 30 seconds. And when we get back, we're going to talk about what your favorite looks are right now your favorite things you said you're down to 10 or 11 so maybe we'll talk a little bit about those i want to pick your brain a little bit about gold uh, so traders hang tight we'll be back in 30 seconds replace your exchange with tradestation crypto dealing with multiple exchanges is complicated and it takes time except with tradestation crypto because we are not an exchange we are a broker you have access to multiple pools of liquidity all in one platform, in one account, one way. Trade crypto your way. Plus, earn interest on your eligible cryptocurrencies. Get started in one click. Welcome back, traders. Mish is still with us. Mish, I want to continue on that conversation of momentum a little bit because I know all the traders listening to this, we're, we're constantly glued to the charts. And it's I scan through my dailies every single day. Uh, every single night and I go through my prep and I say, okay, what's in what sort of a, a of a pattern? I like to see markets that have really strong trends. I mean, Ethereum, I've been talking about this a lot, but it's in that really strong bull trend. You finally get a pullback. It gets back above moving averages. It gets above downtrends. To me, that's good confirmation, whether that's your strategy or not. They're simple confirmations to prove trend is intact. But there's so many markets I see that basically go up further than we think and then they get in these holding patterns and it's easy to get chopped up and it's hard to determine what will come back and look to make new highs. Uh, and I think that's that's something that traders don't talk enough about is really environment. You know, we go from a momentum environment where everything just keeps going and then it finally comes back, you get these opportunities and then it gets really choppy for day and swing traders. What, you said that you have 10, 11, uh, markets that you're still in and you're focused on. What are your favorite ideas of those right now that you feel have the opportunity to continue to move uh, in, in the trends that they're in and where you could see some true follow through? Well, definitely Ethereum. We're still there. We're not going to go anywhere there. Obviously, if it sells off hard, we'll have a protective stop. But other than that, I'm really, really bullish in the alt currency space. And we, in fact, just hired somebody who trades all of the different coins. So he's sort of giving us an education in Litecoin and in Ripple, Dogecoin, things we haven't even touched. And the reason why we haven't touched them is because there's no traditional way to trade them the way there is with Ethereum and with Bitcoin. So I'm always looking out for new things. In terms of everything else, I have this nagging the feeling, and I've had this nagging feeling now for over a year about stagflation as opposed to just inflation. 
Part of it is because historically we haven't seen stagflation in 40 years. Ironically, it's when I got started trading was during the stagflation period. And I see a lot of analogous situations there. Um, so, so I've been really very big positioned in a lot of the soft commodities that I hadn't traded in a long, long time. And we started buying them right after the Nadir in the pandemic in March. So we're, we were long wheat, soybeans, corn, DBA as the agricultural ETF. We're long sugar through cane. And we've been in and out of coffee because coffee's been a little bit more volatile through JO. So I still think that that is a very underwatched area. People don't even think about food commodities. They certainly think about the price of food when they go to the supermarket. But most people who are trade, when I mention corn or wheat or soybeans, they go, oh, wow, you know, I never traded that before. We actually did extraordinarily well, and we're sort of looking to re-enter some of these again as we get into seasonally on top of the supply chain disruptions, on top of the low labor, on top of the fact that the production has been low to cut back on the glut that we had for years. There's also now the situation where we have a weather potential. So I think that that's something to keep an eye on because what I'm looking at now too is the gold. There was that whole conversation, gold versus Bitcoin, you know, like Godzilla versus uh, King Kong. I mean, if I, 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 th I, I think it's ridiculous. Um, great Bitcoin went to two trillion uh, in valuation. Gold is still at a hundred trillion in valuation. So there's gold hasn't gone anywhere. And I actually think as a result of that, we're already in gold, and I would be looking to add to gold um, because I really believe, like again, in the stagflation theory, and the alternative currencies can continue to do well. But I think gold can just really surprise everybody. It's got such a high short float right now. It's been sort of on that back burner and can come out, you know, roaring his chest if that's the King Kong part of the equation and, and, and blow everybody out of the water by rattling. And I think 1750 is really the, the place right now it needs to clear. It's been bouncing up against it and then holding. So we're looking at, we've been in silver, we've been in miners. We're out of that now. We're just in gold. In terms of the overall market, I also really like the banks here. Not all the banks, but we're in Wells Fargo. We've been in Wells Fargo for a while. We actually added to our position in Wells Fargo. Um, we've been looking at some of the stocks that did have to do with a potential infrastructure program. And I'm gonna get tie that back to my stagflation theory in a moment. <clears throat> so we've been in like floor construction, for example, which is really materials for building roads and highways, et cetera. Also because of the housing boom that we've had. So let, and, and let's see what else we're in. We're in, oh, we're in some SPACs. Let's, let's hold on that one for a second. And we've been in Scorpio tankers. That's been one of our biggest oil plays We've been in Scorpio tankers. In fact, I went on uh, Charles Payne's show. I'm on uh, every week with him on making money with Charles Payne on Fox Business. And I told him I was buying Scorpio tankers at $11. And he was like, wow, you are brave. Well, meanwhile, it went up to 20 and now it's sitting between 18, 19. I think the whole shipping area is part of my stagflation theory. Not just what happened in the Suez, but some of these ships have just been unable to move because of what happened after the pandemic, they, they're, not, they're not getting to port on time. So this is a very long roundabout way of saying is, here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking we have real fundamental reasons to be concerned about the price of goods. We've already seen steel, copper, wood go up. We're seeing the food go up. We're seeing sugar go up. Gold and silver has been underperforming, but they can certainly go up to follow. Oil, I think is still the X factor. I'm with you. I think if it sits here long enough, we could probably make a bullish case. We're just looking for some fresh news. And yet, where's the economy going? This is, this is what keeps me up. And when I think about it, certainly Biden wants to do this infrastructure package. We know the politics around it is going to be very dicey. Now we have Yellen going on and on and on about a corporate tax rate globally so that our, our corporations don't go overseas to avoid taxes, et cetera. All of this at the end of the day says to me, how are we going to make the U.S. grow to even remotely compete with China, especially because we need jobs, we need industry, we need more, we need domestic buying, we need the dollar to hold up. 
And I wonder whether or not we can really get a, a surge in growth other than the normal we come back from the pandemic. So that's what I'm looking at. Stagflation means economy stagnates and prices of goods raw and the dollar falls. And what does the Fed have to do? They have to raise the rates. So you really think the Fed is going to raise rates? Not unless they absolutely have to. In fact, I think Jerome Powell, you know, he's speaking again, I guess the FOMC minutes are coming out the day that you and I are talking. And I thought what was so interesting a couple of weeks ago when he talked was that at that point, the yields, remember the 10 year yields were spiking. And I think he was probably looking in the mirror going, shoo, I mean, at least if the yields are spiking, I don't even have to worry about inflation because that's kind of going to take care of it for me. So I think there, people were looking for Operation Twist or they're looking for some kind of QE to bring those yields back down. And he said nothing. And I think that's because he's kind of thinking, well, gee, if those yields spike up naturally, we'll keep the 30 years down. And yet that could in turn keep inflation running out of control in check. Well, that's great in a textbook, but we'll see if it actually happens. Because you and I know as being a floor trader, when commodities get going, it's like Bitcoin. It's emotional. You could take almost those charts and throw them away. Yeah, to totally. And I, you know, I took a bunch of notes, and this is a theme I hear. Danielle DiMartino Booth. I heard it from Tavi Costa, Shy Girl. I listen to Eric Townsend's podcast a lot. Macro Voices. Uh, there's. This is the theme I hear over and over and over again. And one thing I do not hear is stock market. I mean, it's just unbelievable to me that it's like everybody I talk to, nobody is still really bullish the stock market. Everybody is looking at commodities, uh, gold and silver, oil, you know, altcoins, and so am I. I mean, I, I'm not really in a lot. I mean, on my trading side of things, very little uh, trading in my trading in equities right now. Because I see the opportunity here. I, I started off saying, look for where there's momentum, where there's pullback, where there's opportunity, and where will that momentum carry? Because in these markets, the biggest difference that I've noticed from my trading for the first 15 plus years of my career, a lot of mean reversion. It, like The markets just did not go as far as they are going now and, and without some pullbacks. There was a lot more... I don't want to call it chop, but there was just a lot more mean reversion. Now everything just goes and you never feel like you're going to get in at a good price. And then when you look back at the chart, you're like, wow, that was a great price to get in, but I didn't get in. It's hard to for, for me psychologically to wrap my head around buying highs all the time. It's not how I'm built, you know, me but <laughs> right. So when you see charts like this, it's like with crude oil, I, I for a while I was bullish. I just watched it go basically 15 to 20 bucks without being able to have an opportunity to get in a swing position. I finally get in one when it breaks and I lose on it. It's pretty funny. Not, not really in a sense. I'm not really truly happy about it, but it's like when I finally get that chance, that's what's happening in these markets. You have to buy into the momentum, but I know I said a lot there. I, I definitely understand the plays that you're thinking about. We said from the beginning, a theme, but why not stocks? I mean, why, do I not hear anybody really say that they want to be in NASDAQ, S&P, or Russell? What, you didn't say that either. Well, we, we have models that do a lot of that. So if you looked at our model position, like, for example, we have a model called NASDAQ All-Stars. And every month, depending on what's happening with the trend strength indicators, it's pure momentum trading, actually. It rotates. So right now, it actually is in four of the five are semiconductors. So you can see that there is buying going on in semiconductors just through the mere fact of the TSI. And that doesn't necessarily mean that all these stocks will make money. But I kind of look at the stocks differently than the models purposely, because I don't want to repeat what the models are doing, number one. And number two is I'm not a momentum type buyer. I'm like you. I like to see the divergence, or you called it a mean reversion, where the price comes down, but the momentum is actually holding up. If yes. anything, the momentum is diverging positive before the price does. That, to me, is what keeps me excited about trading. So, like... So let's talk about stocks are frustrating right now. If you had been long Microsoft, let's say, for seven months, it did nothing. 
And now all of a sudden, the last few days, since the jobs report, it went up and made a new all-time high. But where is Microsoft going to go from here? It, is, is it going to double in price? No. So then you take some of the newer tech stocks that did unbelievably well in the pandemic. Some of my favorites like Datadog and Teladoc and Fastly, they're doing nothing now, nothing. And when they do rally, they come right back down, the chop that you're talking about. So now let's go to some of the mega trends. Cannabis, you would think this would be an exciting time for cannabis stocks. They've been doing nothing but falling. Yeah. Let's look at solar. I've now gone long first solar and then tan. I made a little teeny money in first solar because I got out sooner than my profit target scratched on the balance said, I'm going to sit with tan, but I'm not going to take a loss scratch today. It's frustrating. I still like solar stocks, but unless you're a real passive investor and sits and doesn't care about 10 to five, 10, 20 percent fall downs or more, which Certainly that's not the mold that you and I are cut from. There's no money there. So where's the money right now? It's like they say, oh, it's a stock picker's market. Well, I bought NEO. I bought NEO thinking it's sitting by a major moving average. I got a good risk. It certainly had some good news in showing that it was actually doing a lot better than people thought. So we got into NEO yesterday and I'm underwater. Now, not like getting killed or anything because it's far from our stop yet. But still, it's frustrating right here for stocks. Believe it or not, the only thing that's really making me money is, like I said, the commodity-related stocks like Scorpion Tankers and Wells Fargo, the banks, because I think that now the banks, you know, in June are going to be able to buy back their own stock, raise their dividends. There'll be a stress test coming out. So that's kind of forward thinking. So you buy it before it happens. That's the way you and I like to do things. And I'm into a couple of specs. Because I'm looking for things that the rest of the world is not watching right now. And there are, I mean, we know that we started out with like an $838 billion surge in SPAC buying in January. But now the SEC kind of put their big hand on it, brought them down, and I see some opportunity there. So we got a couple of SPACs there as well. But that's it. That's why people aren't buying equities. It's hard. I got to tell you, you know, I've been day trader through and through most of my career and the s p and nasdaq I t we talked a lot about environment here when they get into these environments they're difficult to trade and people were sending me messages saying well why aren't you talking more about these markets right now well because i, I want to find things where i am going to get follow through cleaner moves and i know a lot of the people listening to this are day traders and I get that. And you can have your little day trading systems for the intraday. And, I, and I'm still going to do that when it's busy, but you're not getting a ton of busy days. So when I do get them, I trade them. But when I'm not, I've really been focusing more on, on the things that you were talking about. I mean, you and I are very similar in what we like. I like primary trend markets that pull back, that all of a sudden you start to see opportunity for that momentum to continue. Because, and I've already mentioned it today, we are in a world of where everything is momentum when things start to get going now. It hap I just watching it happen and going, Anthony, you better smarten up and start recognizing this is what we see. This is what it is. Go back and pull up a chart of soybeans. Like you said, you know, when the commodities get going, they get going. I have not traded a ton of them. I've done a little bit of it, uh, mm -hmm. but I've been really looking more in the softs like you talked about in gold, in silver, because when they start to go, and that's the thing with gold, and I, I wanna go there next before we get into rapid fire is, you know, gold is one of those things, and, I, and I've said this a bunch of times lately, it's it's a market that does the same pattern we've been talking about. It, when it starts going, it goes way further than you think, and then when it starts to come back down, it does nothing for a period of time, nobody wants to own it, it's that same thing to where uh, that thought process of is why am I holding gold right now? And, and that, that that psychology through gold happens through and through. When it starts going down, you start going, eh, I got to go somewhere else. And all of a sudden it's up and it gets chased again. And the, the timing of that is so difficult. I have really struggled so far in the last few months trading gold. I've been getting stopped out pretty much every time. It's not been fun. Luckily, crypto has been really good for me. But <laughs> I mean, really, it's just, you know, I'm yeah. honest about it. It's just been tough. I don't know what else to say. I, I have the macro idea for gold too. I, I see everything that's that's happening here. And, and I think it's been a good play. I, I've actually been going into the miners more uh, these days and just sitting in the miners position uh, because I felt that's a little bit better. But 
timing of what you think with gold. You say the 1740, 1750 uh, area. I think gold today, last I looked, was 1740. I don't have the chart up right now, but is it going to be price that 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 actually is going to determine where you think we start to get going again? Uh, because I don't think the Fed is going to do much, at least at this point. We talked about how themes are what's set up for you. Uh, is it just really going to come down to gold getting above pr some prices now that you think will accelerate it to the upside? Because I know a lot of people out there listening are going, well, when the hell do I get in this thing? A couple of things. I think if the, the the yield, if after the Fed meeting, the initial reaction is that the yields actually tighten again in terms of the short term yields, the ten year yields, and gold doesn't sell off, I think that will certainly bring some attention to it. Yes. If the stock market has any kind of correction and the gold doesn't sell off that will bring some attention to it as it should because it means now the ratio between gold and the s p could start to actually go the other way because as we know right now the s p has well outperformed the gold and i do think that there's a price point 1800 is probably psychologically more the price point than 1750 but i'm looking at 1750 right now because in the short term we've just not been able to clear it we broke 17 we got down to like 1680 and it completely turned right back around there's buyers out there what's so interesting anthony is i talked to a lot of the guys i traded with on the floor the ones that are still alive <laughs> And, uh, and I, we actually do it through Facebook. There's some few groups that have formed from the old days, you know, and, then, and then that's really fun to talk to these guys. They're bullish. They're bullish because they're seeing what I'm seeing because they were there. And then you talk to, or you see on Twitter guys like, I think it's Rosenthal that came out and said, gold is finished, gold is going down. And, you know, you get these macro guys and you say, gee, just going back to what you and I were talking about in the very beginning, you could be a macroeconomist, but it means jack, because you have to have the timing of a floor trader. And so I think the floor traders that I know from back in the day are, are they're sensing it, they're feeling it. Gold tried to collapse it last week, it couldn't, it turned right around, it turned right around on volume. And like I said, if we cannot knock it down, if rates can't do it and a correction in the market doesn't do it, then I think all of a sudden gold can just go and 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 maybe head to two thousand pretty quickly maybe, and I'm I am talking my position a little bit I'll admit it, but I'd like to buy more so it's not like I'm so heavily loaded right here. Yeah, I mean, I feel the same way, and that's just kind of what I said. When it starts to go, it goes, and and the thing is for me, one of the things I've actually started to do the last couple of positions I went to options because as I was buying it on the way down in the futures, I was just getting too chopped up. And I said, you know what, you gotta start looking at options here. And I started to hold a position in the miners because at least I can just stay through it. And if it starts to go, risk. yeah, right. I, I start to have, now that I've gone through that, if through this downward move, I, I have some positions on to where it starts to go, then I can go to the futures and trade the price action because once again, it's always about timing. I mean, I see people that have been talking about buying gold for since, you know, whatever. I mean, look at Peter Schiff, right? I mean, I, I think he's great, but it's like, <laughs> well, you know, he's yeah. never- Is he Godzilla or is he King Kong? I'm yeah, he's sure never he's bearish it, but it's, you know, it's broken 350 bucks in the last few months. Right. And, you know, um, but, you know, just because- it's just very hard to hold those positions as traders. So that's why I like to talk about the timing of it. What is it? I believe the macro theme is intact. I don't think it's going to change. I think it really does come down to pricing now. Uh, that's why I asked you that because it just feels as though it needs to prove some price levels for people to hold and stop getting bled on this stuff. And once it gets going, it's that thing that just, it builds up momentum. It just, that's really the theme today. It's just everything is momentum until it just gets sucked out and then it's momentum again, just like that. Um, that's the world we live in now, Mish. It, it's, yes. it's, and, and, and then we have so many other little worlds, nucleuses of worlds around us. Like we have the Kathy Wood world. So she looks at things so differently than I do. And yet we have some of the same kind of visions about the future with 3D printing, with data collection, with you know some of these other blockchain technologies. I know she's really, really bullish Tesla. How could you not be? You know, I always say never bet against the hand of the king being Elon Musk. But where we part is that she's not a commodities trader. So she doesn't care about these huge downturns. She'll sit with these trends because she sees them looking forward. Space frontier, yeah, 
exciting as all heck, space frontier, but we're traders, right? So I, what I see in the, in, in the nearer term is keep your eye on those things, but exactly what you said, the momentum on all of that stuff has faded here while the momentum in the commodities keeps building. And by the way, we also bought natural gas. Do you want to talk about a, something that terrifies me, but yet I do it anyway? It's it's natural. I mean, I was there when crack spreads. I don't, I don't really. trade that beast. <laughs> I know. No, nobody. I'm I'm you know I'm kind of fearless as long as I know where I'm wrong. I'm kind of fearless. But we're in natural gas now too because that's another one they've been trying to drive it down and drive it down. Meanwhile, Musk moved to Texas because he wanted to be closer to natural gas. It's still really cheap, and it's still a cleaner energy than let's say oil. So even though the Biden administration, they rumors that they poo pooed it before he came in. The truth of the matter is, is he's kind of stepped back on that because they realize that natural gas is a viable solution as a sort of cleaner energy. And I like the chart because they tried to drive out every single long there was. And now today, as we're talking, it's green. So this is how I'm looking at things is what can't people control? They can't, people need to eat. People need to have a roof over their head. They need to fuel their cars. Uh, and they need to, you know, have food on, which unless it's a manufactured type of fabric, we're looking at cotton. And these commodities right here are in short supply. And I think as the demand goes, as we know from our lessons in back in the day, is you get that hoarding mentality and then off they go. So I feel it. It's like percolating in my system. <laughs> no, it's it, it's I, I got to tell you, I agree with with a lot of what you said today. And, you know, I talked a little bit about environment and it's so important traders to identify the environments that we're in. Now I'm somebody, and, I, and I've said this and I'm actually gonna retract on kind of like how I, I talked about this for years was basically, I was a one product trader. And I said, really, I think that's where you make most of your money. And I think that's because kind of our background. Right. And my thinking has had to change on that. And, but I, I do believe still that new traders starting with one product is really the way to go, learn it, become best friends with that product, understand every little nuance about it. And even to this day, the new products that I'm trading, uh, they're not new products, but some of them are, but the new things that I'm trading, I try to really develop relationships with them because the execution of them is a little bit different. Certain indicators I think work good on some markets, not so good on other markets. I think you still have to do that research, but the theme the overall environment that we're in is momentum till it's sucked out. And then does momentum continue or does it continue just to be a chop fest? And for my way of trading now that I've had to adapt because we all do is to look for where those opportunities are. And I think you laid out a great really understanding of how it starts off with stagflation, why you're looking at things and building certain markets to, that you know what you're looking for. So when they do finally set up on the charts, you go in with confidence and execute them. Right, Mish? I mean, that's just what it is. Absolutely, and I just wanna reinforce something you said in the very beginning, which I think is so important, which is we always tell people, try to become a specialist in one thing, whether it's one product like I did. I mean, I traded only sugar, coffee once in a while, hardly ever cocoa for three years before I moved on. So whether it's either a product or it's a strategy, it, get in, get into one strategy. And I think people get really confused and mixed up because there's so many different ways. So yeah, be a specialist in one thing and then you can start to build your tool chest from there. Exactly, I, I think that's so important because look at, I'm a veteran, I've been doing this, this is my 22nd year doing this trading markets for myself and, and I'm still working on how I'm going about this. It's a constant work in progress. And I've had to really change a lot of my thinking going back to I, adapting to this type of momentum because it's just not what I really, how I see the market, but I've been forced to find ways to make it work for me because the old ways of thinking and things I were, was doing was not working, was not making me money. Uh, and, and that's why, like I said, I, for years, my bread and butter was S&P. I barely trade it anymore. I mean, I'm trading Ethereum now. I'm trading, you know, crude oil, gold, because that's where I see the follow through potentially coming. And I want things, I want to be a part of things that are following through, not a part of things that are doing a lot of chop, even though S&P is following through to the upside. I'm just, I'm just missing it, Mish. I don't know what to say. I'm, I'm letting it do it because I can't 
I can't do it here. But that's a whole other story conversation. Well, but what you're really talking about is that you're separating your ego from the actual strategy of trading. And boy, if there's something you learn being on the floor quickly is take your ego and park it outside. You know, put it in your Maserati because don't bring it onto the floor. It's going to destroy you. And that's it. You know, it's people think, oh, I know that I'm going to be right, or I know I can do this, or I know, you know, I know, I know, I know, I hear a lot of I know. And in order for you to stay in the game, you've been in it for 22 years. To get to where I'm at at 40 years now, there's a lot of, a lot of not only losing your ego, the attachment to being right, learning how to be wrong and just move on, move on, don't attach. Um, yeah. And then when you are right, the way you get rich is you add to your winners. And that yes. is something that I learned on the floor that a lot of people don't understand. They'll add to losers, which makes no sense, before they would add to winners because the psychology is, oh, my God, I'm making money. I'm making money. This is great. I better get out. And when it's going down, we're so programmed to fail. They're like, oh, oh, all right. All exactly. right. I'm feeling the pain, but it'll eventually come back. So yeah, I mean, these, this is all part of it. And right now it, it's good to just sort of step aside and see where the market goes from here. Uh, the market is still testing this new administration. They got bold ideas, but they still got a lot of stuff to deal with here. It's going on out of their control. No question. And just to finish this up before we get into rapid fire, if you can't see it, if you're not feeling it, I think that you can have a strategy but sometimes if you're not visually seeing how things are going to happen in a market, you just struggle with the confidence to execute it. Because some of the things I was seeing in S&P and I would look around, I mean, if I'm not feeling it, and I know that people say, there's leave your emotions out of it. or But if, I, if I'm if i not looking at something and actually visual, I'm a, such a visual person where I see how the pattern will continue or I see certain things happening, I just tend to stay away from it. And the things that I truly do see, getting back to what you said, I did a whole segment on this this week with Develop Your Edge. I was in a crude oil position that wasn't working. What I saw, what I thought I saw hap was going to happen didn't. I covered it before my stop and I added to my Ethereum because what I visually saw could happen was happening and I added to what was working. Because, and that took me years to kind of get to that mindset where you're like, I have to stop focusing on this negative thing right here that's not working because it will just overwhelm you. It'll take away from what is working. And that's how you don't add to a winner. Because like you said, you're like, well, I got this winner working for me, but let me focus all my energy on this loser right here because this is where I need to add or I need to hold this one. Get rid of it. I mean, it's amazing. These markets are so liquid. You can get out of a position and sometimes just by getting flat, you feel better and you're like, I shouldn't even have been in this anymore. It isn't working. But when you're in it, you're attached to it and, you know, get right back in if you want. I don't, you know, I think that's something that we have learned just because, uh, once again, being on the floor and, and now with electronic trading, it's so much even easier. You just click out. Um, so I think that is really a big part of developing as a trader. Absolutely. I, I, you said it perfectly. I, I have nothing to add to that because that was a, a perfectly stated situation right there. Well, thanks, Mish. Now we have some rapid fire questions next. So are you ready for those? I'm ready. All right, traders, our rapid fire segment is sponsored by Trading Technologies. Trade the global markets with TT. They are the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. Now with integrated tools for advanced options trading, cryptocurrencies, and trade surveillance. Learn more at tradingtechnologies.com. Mish, first question for you. What trader influenced your career the most and why? I'd have to say my husband, Keith Schneider, who I met down on the Commodities Exchange. He was a member of all the exchanges. He's devoted his life to creating tools for traders off the floor. And he has really taught me this whole idea of macro with exquisite floor timing. Hardest thing to overcome as a trader? For me, it was really coming from a place of abundance as opposed to scarcity. I, I had no money when I started. And sort of you're still always the person that you started as. And so to me, it's always been a lifelong, not so much anymore because I'm older, but as a lifelong battle against the fear of losing money. That was my biggest obstacle. I'm finally overcoming it, but I'm constantly helping other people do the same. How has your trading process evolved over the years? 
I think as I get older and more experienced, I get simpler in terms of my trading process. I rely on a few key indicators, the key moving averages, the phases that it's in, volume patterns, basic chart patterns, and kind of really have put the blinders on to a lot of other things other than what you and I talked about a lot earlier is momentum, because I think that's super important. What is one attribute that you believe every trader should have? A knowledge of charts. <laughs> What's your favorite book about trading? Hmm. Oh, let's see. That's a good question. Ah. Uh, well, I think there's a there's an old book about commodities that you, is out of print and costs hundreds of dollars now. I can't tell you the exact name. I'd have to get back to you on that. But it's an old hardcover book. I'd have to ask my husband the name. These are the kinds of things that escape me. These minor details. <laughs> But it's, 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 it's a, the basic primer on commodities trading, and it tells you everything you need to know about that. And that, I go back to that quite a lot. Throughout your career, what's the best piece of advice another trader gave you about trading? I think the best piece of advice was to, when you go, is that we streak, that trade is streak. And so understand the streak you're in. And if you're in a good streak, play it out for as long as that streak lasts. And when you see the streak end, and it streaks in the market, but I'm talking personally as a trader streak, when it ends, have the wisdom to step back. But push it when it's there and pull back when it's not. Oh, I love that. It is, just, it is just so true. Now, if you could give a piece of advice to the younger, newer traders out there, what would you say to them? I would say that Partly what you and I talked about is try to become a specialist in one thing to get started. And most, most, most important are two things. One is understanding risk control. And two is understanding position sizing, which is, ah, there's a book we can talk about, Van Tharp, who is the expert in position sizing. Really make sure you know what that means. And that would really give you a lot of information to get going, knowing that you're not going to lose your shirt. Last question for today. If you had an elevator pitch me your edge in trading, what would you say? I'll go back to what I said before, is that I have the knowledge of a macroeconomist, but the timing of a floor trader. Oh, that's great. Got to tell you, Mitch, this was awesome. So much fun speaking with you. You know, after all the years following you, getting a chance to speak with you today, big fan of yours. You do excellent work. Um, really learned a lot from you today. I, I truly appreciate uh, you taking the time. Before I let you go, where can people find you on Twitter? And I know I could see the market gauge back there. Give us a website. It's www.marketgauge.com. You'll find a lot of great stuff there. Daily blogs that we write, weekly ones that my husband Keith Schneider does with a video. Um, and also we just have a lot of other stuff like glossary of terms and about our products and our philosophy. And then the best place really to follow me is on Twitter and that's at Market Minute. I'm there probably too much, but I am there and I'm always very, very amenable to answering any question, whether it's what do you think of this or whatever it is, I'm there to answer. At this point in my career, I really love giving back my knowledge to people who, who, who are seeking uh, help from somebody. Yeah, traders, definitely go out there and follow Mish on Twitter. Mish, what can I say? Thank you so much for joining me on Futures Radio Show today. Thank you, Anthony. It's so much fun to be here with you. Great to meet you. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a review on iTunes. You can listen to all of our episodes on FuturesRadioShow.com, iTunes, YouTube, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher.